Hello, this is the second part to a much, much longer reaction. If you haven't seen the first part of this yet, links to it are both in the description as well as in the corner cards. Now, with all that out of the way, let's actually get back to the second part, shall we? Rare is one of the more mysterious gods, seldom showing much to mortals at all. Marina's never heard of a rare sigil serving as a portal, and she has no idea where it's taken her, or if she's even gone anywhere at all. What is this? It's only as she stops to catch her breath that she's able to think about the monster that chased her here. It was hulking, muscular, built like a man. But those overalls, didn't they belong to the engineer? Wait, what? Shognar is a terrible foe this early in the game. Shognar? It can hit you with a debuff that will kill you in two turns, it has a lot of hit points, it punches very hard, and it has an instant kill attack where it just grabs you and crushes your head. Oh, great, okay. The best thing to do is retreat. Though, this is your only chance to meet this game. If you went to the manor and saved Henrik, it might be worth waiting to come here until you have a full party and can fight the monster. Okay. On defeat, Shognar gives the player the caressing soul. That's because this monster is the mutated form of Abella, the engineer. Oh. Unless you're playing as her, Abella will always come straight to this bunker. If you didn't show up to accompany her, she will become Shognar. And I'm guessing that maybe this does that have something to do with that parasite that the 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 woodcutter had. Dude of you might recognize Shognar as a creation of Frank Belknap Long, but per the developer, the name is merely a nod to a visual similarity, rather than any kind of meaningful reference. Okay. So, how did this happen? Well, remember the woodsman? Yeah. The conversation with the new gods in the first game reveals that his parasitic appendage might be something that attached itself to him rather than a part of his body. It can skitter around on its little facehugger legs and attack independently of the woodsman, and once it attacks the player, it's stuck on for good. The creature, again, per the developer, is based on Half-Life's head crab, and there must be more than one of them. Oh no. It would appear that Abella was parasitized by one of these little critters, and then, either due to its influence or more likely some other force, the conjoined pair mutated into the monster known as Shognar. Oh. As for why this happens, or why it would take this particular form, well, more on that later. Oh, okay, wonderful, great. I, I, I wait with bated breath. The shabby wooden walls of the nightmare. The place looks exactly like the collective dream of the workshop, and what's more, it reminds her of the strange constructions she saw in Old Town. Could there be some connection? All made out of wood. The monsters here are predictably even stranger. Big Venus flytrap looking things buried in foul smelling mounds of dirt. Ugh. They emerge to reveal a second, much more suggestive Venus flytrap mouth and dangerous scythe blade arms. Oh great, okay. Buried in the mounds, if one cares to check, are rust colored pearls, flawless and beautiful to behold. Rust covered pearl? Eventually, Marina climbs Colored, up the ladder and finds herself back in the bunker. Half dazed by the shock of the incident and the toll the spell casting took on her sanity, she climbs the ladder and back to the surface, breathless and shaking. The first uh. thing she sees are a pair of jackboots and the barrel of a pistol. The Bremen lieutenant towering over her motions for her to come on up. This is Pavel Yudin, a Voronian who found his way into Kaiser's army. He makes a few lewd remarks as he leers at Marina and suggests that she stay very still if she doesn't want to get shot. Oh no. Luckily, it turns out that what Pav really wants is a way into the city. The gate is barred by two locks and he's come here to get one of the keys. But he won't take it from Marina. Instead, he charges her with getting the other and opening the gate. He tells her to be a good girl- <laughs> Why did you home. make this creep so attractive? Unfortunately, because we saved Henrik, we're stuck taking the long way around. The other key is never found on this route. Instead, Henrik hands over a key he found at the manor, which sends the player up through a very gross sewer maze if they want to get into the city. Oh, wonderful. So now let's rewind and check out scenario B. Yay! In this scenario, Karen never went to the manor, instead just snooping around Old Town, and Marina reached the bunker first. As Marina opens the hatch in the ground, a tall, fit, red-headed woman comes running up. This is- Oh my god, really? <laughs> the engineer from the train. What's she doing out here? Abella, as it turns out, is scavenging the forest for train parts. Well, that makes about as much sense as anything else today, Marina supposes. Yeah, that is kind of weird. And so the two women descend into the tunnels together. There, they encounter the clown, who kills Tanaka. Running from him, they activate the elevator, head into the pit, and find a strange machine which is apparently called a telectroscope. Telectroscope? Abella casually turns it on while messing with the controls, and while it starts up successfully, it's not clear what, if anything, that did. There's no Shognar this time, but they do find the key and a letter along with it. It's from Raise a dead the dead addressed to his girl back home. The letter all but confirms that Preheviel was Kaiser's target from the start, but it seems the army's rank and file don't understand why. 
Yeah, I would think. Upon leaving, they're confronted by Pop, who just as in the other scenario, tells them to find the other key and open the gate. But the women are tired and traumatized after seeing Tanaka die so horribly. They head back to the train and tell the others what they saw, then settle down to rest. Another dream? Oh, yeah, another dream. Marina is gone when Abella wakes. It's night, and the few still at the train are shivering against the cold. Nobody's seen her at all. Sensing something amiss, Abella makes her way to Old Town. The gates are still shut, but an old beggar sat behind them strikes up a conversation. Apparently, he's Great. still mostly sane Weird. and somehow still alive. <laughs> mostly sane is the key word there. Kaiser's men have barricaded the city, closing all outside access. They killed the old mayor, who'd aligned with the Eastern Army, and took one of his gate keys, the one that Abella recovered in the bunker. Okay. The other, he says, should be in the new mayor's possession. We don't have the new mayor, town, but the new guy just arrived. Okay. Eventually, Abella Who's finds this the guy? manor and is cordially told that she's expected for dinner with the master of the house. Jeeves, the butler, advises her not to mention his antlers. Though he has the same twisted features as many of the townspeople, Jeeves seems far too cultured to engage in their senseless violence. <laughs> I love that. I love. He's just. He's. It, it doesn't matter if people are being driven insane by the by the power of the old gods. He's far too cultured to be be part of the riffraff and such. <laughs> I'd, I'd love that or actually what was it uh, and, and something something sort of tangentially related I think it was in it was in one of the tabletop RPGs that's like based around Cthulhu I think there is a trait you can get during character creation where you're just too dumb to recognize sort of like the unholy otherworldness of the of like of like the creatures created by like the Lovecraftian horrors, and you're and you and you're basically immune to the sanity loss effects from it. So you just see, oh, that's a really ugly dog. Kill it when it comes to attack you. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that guy looks pretty ugly. It's, it's I I just I love the concept that the complete antithesis to the absolute wrongness that Lovecraftian horrors are supposed to embody is just being really, really stupid. Upstairs, Abella sneaks past the dark priest as he prays and manages to find a set of keys. Oh, hey, it's you! In the mayor's bedroom, she discovers Marina, who is trying to act nonchalant about having been kidnapped and locked away here. Oh, she was kidnapped? Okay. The two women reunited. Abella makes for the kitchen to see what this dinner invitation is about, but Marina freezes in her tracks. The mayor is a major creep, she says, and she won't go anywhere near him again. A major creep, you say? Yeah. And in what sense of the word do you mean he is like a creep as in like socially or do you mean that he's creepy to look at hides by the stairs while labella boldly steps into the kitchen to see what the fuss is all about oh this is the gentleman a monstrous figure with twisted horns and a hideous face he invites abella to sit while the pair share a meal he's the gentleman big says he came to preheville to sample the local delicacies but is disappointed with the state of the place everybody's gone mad he says nobody wants to talk about art or poetry oh okay well abella stares down at the food in front of her this is almost certainly human flesh. Luckily, the mayor doesn't seem to notice that she's not eating. Dinner with the gentleman is a conversation in which you must do everything possible to avoid angering Preheville's new mayor. Mentioning his antlers, being vulgar, or general impoliteness are likely to trigger a fight. And he is terribly powerful, easily severing limbs with his knife and ripping huge wounds open with his fork. Oh, wonderful. Speaking to him during combat clarifies his motivations quite a bit. Terminet is the moon god's deadly festival, and it's been turned on the whole town. But he's not going to play Rare's game. Instead, he's going to live out his final days indulging in whatever wicked hedonism he can, starting with kidnapping and cannibalism and going who knows where from there. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> Henrik was an Epicurean, a man with refined tastes and a desire to share them with the world. As the gentleman, he's a vulgar parody of his former self. What? Oh, of course. Another character that turns into a monster. Okay, so instead of, you know, elephant man just mindless no he's a he's a gentleman who just he's he's sad about the state of the world and will and as a result will you know indulge in cannibalism sure he was a skirt chaser and maybe a bit of a snob about food but we never get any indication that he wanted to have a good time at anybody else's expense the whole reason he even came out here was to do something nice for everyone and impress abella now she doesn't even recognize him oh he grants henrik's suffocated soul a worthy prize for any characters that boosts melee combat skill and allows for cooking superior meals. Right, because he was in the uh, he was in the mayor's office, and 
or not in the mayor's office, he was in the mayor's house and he was going in sort of, some sort of weird trance hearing like clocks and stuff. But if you don't have somebody go in to like pull him out, he turns into this. Okay. If dinner goes smoothly, however, the gentleman asks Sabella a final question. Is she for Kaiser or against him? She answers truthfully, against, and he gives her the missing key to the city, telling her that he can't do much from his position, but she has his tacit support. You're the mayor! As for Marina, she seems unharmed when we find her, but traumatized nonetheless. Yeah, There's by the weird- else here, too. The villagers outside describe being infected by a green light that got inside of them and began the change, but Henrik was indoors when he got hit. And just like Abella, he was nowhere near the three-day time limit. He turned basically immediately. Who's this guy? There's a locked room in the basement, accessible only by drawing a Venushka circle in the priest's room. It contains pulsating purple organs that look like they've been tapped. Oh, the the... nearby contain dark dried mucus that sticks to the bottom. Evil they hearts. They similar to the hearts of the god of the depths in the first game. Okay. The green light can change a person, but so can the darkness. It's certainly suspicious that Henrik and Abella can mutate so early in the contest. Neither gets much time to even try to participate before they turn. Shopmar is mm. found in Tunnel 7 with that clown, while the gentleman seems to have been chosen by the town itself to be the new mayor. It's something to think about. For now, the women leave the manor in peace. And chosen finally by the town. Sea. Marina's destination oh, is the massive freaky. cathedral on the east side of town. Too much time has been wasted now. She must confront her father and discover whether he's alive, still sane, and what truly happened to her mother. Oh, it's the police! Is, is but that the situation in the city seems no better than outside. The women hear boots running toward them and a distorted voice shrieking that they're in violation of the high the priest's curfew order. The streets are patrolled primarily by bobbies. These multi-armed monsters resemble an abstract pastiche of a police officer, and catching three batons in one turn is enough to kill a healthy character. Alone, they're usually too much to die, but with an ally, the fight gets a lot easier. Their arms will regenerate two turns after being destroyed, and breaking their legs does nothing to expose their head. The trick is to simply keep attacking their arms until their head eventually stops spinning. A single tap usually defeats them. Oh, okay. But your work isn't done. Examine the body and choose to beat it to finish the monster off, or oh. we'll get back up. Oh no, they they, they raise from the dead. Oh no, it's one of the, they're one of those enemies. Ugh. Oh. Outside the church, a gigantic furred creature shreds a bobby to pieces with a pair of spears before leaping off into the night. It's a circle. What the hell is it doing here? I'm sorry, a what? Circles are a fictional creature created by a furry artist. A YouTuber named Neko the Circle helped popularize the first game in its very early days, and Miro thanked them with a cameo. Okay. I heard them correctly. I mean, I've been on the internet long enough to know that... To know what a circle is, huh? So okay, so I know like in in like furry culture, circle is just a weird hybrid animal. But what does it have to do with in this game? Is it like uh, like in the world of the game? I mean, is it like one of those rare fantastical creatures that still somehow exists in the world? And given that fact, saw it with a spear means that it is like. It's a tool using, it is intelligent. In the Fear and Hunger world, Circles are a folkloric creature said to inhabit the dark continent of Vinland. Oh. Sharon would lose her mind if we told her we saw one. It, it, it reminded that, that literally answered my question. There we go. Some people apparently got very mad that a furry thing was in the game, which is pretty, which is a pretty good argument for including it. <laughs> Imagine seeing Bigfoot in Prague. Inside, the church yeah. is relatively undamaged. Three effigies are missing from their pedestals at the altar. But otherwise, the place is in remarkably decent order. Okay. There's a confessional in the East Wing, and Marina decides to step inside. To her surprise, someone's on the priest's side. It's not her father's voice, but what the heck. No time like the present to unburden herself and confess her sins. <laughs> she emerges from the confessional oh, at the same time as the man on the other side. It's not a priest, but Osa, the Abyssonian man from the train. Marina's face goes beet red when she realizes the trick he's pulled, and he bursts into laughter. He apologizes, saying it was too good of an opportunity to pass up, and that he's happy to have learned something about a fellow contestant. Osa is curious about the secrets this land holds beneath its surface, okay. and he has no time to hang around. He bids the women farewell, offering Marina a genuine apology, and wanders off. Wait, is he... I mean, he's just all in yellow. Is he one of those, like, yellow wizards from the previous game? Wasn't the, um, wasn't the floating head, like, their, their leader or something, before he got obliterated? The Yellow Mages are a cult who follow the great wizard Nasra. 
In the fifth Nasra, century, that's Nasra was a new god and ruled the eastern sanctuaries with an iron fist until the fellowship rose up and beheaded him. He was last seen three and a half centuries ago, picking a fight with the embodiment of destruction. It didn't go well for him, and since then his cult nearly died out. Oh! But Nasra hasn't left the world just yet. He's fried, scarred, and largely impotent, but Osa has brought him to Prehevil, though he's been demoted from a party member to an accessory. Oh, Most people can't okay. hear his whispers, but if you play as Osa, you'll occasionally get some illuminating comments from him about characters or lore. Osa begins on the opposite end of the magical spectrum from Marina. Where her skills are largely passive and supportive, he is all about raw power and can modify his spells with a Spice Forge skill. Spice Forge? Pretty much the only downside to playing as Osa is that he can't use guns. There are a couple of areas that are a really big headache without them, but otherwise, he's easily one of the strongest characters. Okay. On the west stairwell, the women discover the mutilated remains of a workman. It's unclear what even happened to him. He's basically just chunks now. Ugh. He left some notes mentioning where he hid his tools, and sure enough, there's a pair of bolt cutters under the floor. Up in the rafters, strange, brutal creatures pace back and forth like living gargoyles. Their Ugh. arms bound and their flat-topped heads peeled open. They scream about agony and the chorus of armor as they try to knock the hair off the edge. Wait, you have to attack their abs individually? Okay. The pillar notice that one of their abdominals will be breathing slightly. It's very easy to miss the animation. You have to really look closely. Destroy that one, and the creature will die on the next turn. Using the bolt gun, Abella snaps the chain holding the great chandelier to the ceiling. It crashes down to the floor, breaking open a way to the lower level. Yeah, just jump down from the ceiling, sure. The basement is a nightmare, shocking Marina. She grew up here, and while there was always an old dungeon down here, in her memory it was just a disused legacy of a bygone era. Now it's true with mangled human used. body parts and the reek of blood and death. Ugh. They pass a strange purple snail as they move through the corridor toward a gigantic rare sigil which contains three smaller seals. Purple Atop snail? Them, a statue of a winged man folded in shame or suffering holds aloft one of the effigies from upstairs. The rare sigil is nothing new, but these seals require some examination. Okay. These are real world symbols taken from the Ars Goetia, a oh. part of the Lesser Key of Solomon, a 17th century book about demonology. Oh. Goetia is one of the three most common types of magic known to medieval Europeans and forms much of the basis for our ideas about demonic pacts and seals today. Oh, It was widely really? considered to be evil witchcraft and denounced by the church and society as evil and unclean. I mean, as to be expected. These are the seals of three demons from that book. Valifar, Crocel, and Astaroth. All three are dukes of hell, the second most powerful position dukes beneath the king, and can serve as familiar spirits to help a summoner accomplish a certain task. This church is supposed to be dedicated to Almer, to see a sigil of an old god down here would be one thing. But here, rare symbol has been used to conceal the signs of three demons. Which is really beyond the pale. This is and really weird. Real world symbolism. This statue looks like a fallen angel. Martyr effigy. Crimson Father is open with a mind control attack that can easily cause a wipe. Oh, the purple mind snail! characters don't usually deal much damage to party members, but having one of your characters uncontrollable in a fight against an enemy that deals this much damage is not ideal. The general strategy is to take out their knife arm and then go for the other. Attacking their leg tentacles will then expose the head. After a turn or two, they'll morph into their alternate form, going from a snail head to a monster to something right out of the thing. Oh no. It seems likely that these are what has been leaving all the chewed up people parts around. Yeah. Attempting to speak with the monstrosities reveals that they come from another world in service to an unknown god, but little else. An unknown god. Great. This is a sprawling complex complete with a shortcut elevator back to Old Town. As if, I mean, as as if this world didn't have enough gods already. Now there are ones that just aren't known. It would seem that the church has been preying on the poor, abducting them via this elevator and using them for their evil rituals. Eventually, the two find another rare circle. As and into the, the wood world. transports them to what appears to be a shoddy wooden replica of the church in a void of infinite black. A strange girl in a black pinafore stands atop an altar, observing a pulsating column of human flesh. Oh, wonderful. The vague shapes of several people seem to have merged together under the dead-eyed gaze of an old man's face at the top. She turns toward the pair okay. and gasps in surprise. Marina, I knew you'd come for me. What? This is Samari, a young woman who went to school with Marina and became obsessed with her. Marina has no idea who she is. 
Oh she no, we got a psycho Marina here. All of her secrets. In an increasingly panicked and frustrated tone, she insists that she's met Marina many times, that they have an intimate relationship. She says she knew all about how much Marina hated her father, and that's why she came here and killed him. What? Now, the two of them can be together forever in this wooden world, made just for them. Oh Anxiety no. Anxiety becomes mania, as she claims to have constructed this world herself and says that she trapped Domek forever in this pillar. He was the last obstacle to their love, and had to be removed so that the two could be together. Oh but no. Marina loses it, saying she has no idea who the other girl is and doesn't care. She's just a psychotic monster like all the others out there, and she can stay here and rot for all she cares. The rejection sends Samory spiraling, and she hunches over, screaming as she mutates into something horrible. Oh, that this doesn't sound good at all. Ah! She's a very dangerous spellcaster. This Morphia? She's hurting with both of her arms every turn, which will quickly sever limbs and chew through your HP. It's probably best to bring several friends and meat shields to the fight. And meat a pair shields, of yeah. goes a long way toward making sure you leave here in one piece. Dysmorphia collapses, still murmuring that she's radiating before giving up the ghost. Specifically, the radiating soul. Okay. Samari's radiating soul is excellent for any spellcaster, as it has two abilities which allow you to double dip on divine affinity with Sylvian and Grogoroth without wasting precious circles. Oh, okay. Sylvian's magic is great for healing and crowd control, while Grogoroth offers both damage and utility. After the fight, Marina has a bit of a freak out. She says that her father was an arrogant and bitter man who hated the world and wondered why it didn't love him back. She says that he got exactly what he deserved before storming off so that whatever's left of him can't see her crying. Oh, God. Well, let's take a few steps back. Let's say that Marina and Abella never went to the church. Let's say they never went to the mayor's manor. Abella never fell asleep, and the pair never explored Tunnel 7. Oh, okay. This Half time, see. it's morning of the first day. The contestants have all just had the dream for the first time and awoke to found their train stopped. After a short discussion, Marina leaves the train, passes the woodsman's house, finds the gate locked, and goes down to the bunker. Abella meets her and they climb down together. But this time, they immediately find a pair of bolt cutters. This is random, but it can happen. Okay. Marina explains the situation to Abella. <sighs> Wait, are you saying that the, the chance of finding bolt cutters is literally random? Okay. Her dad and that they can get into town with these. Abella can't very well say that she's actually a freedom fighter on a secret rescue mission, and anyway, it doesn't look like anyone else is down here, so they leave. Now they're in the town. Abella can always double back later, and anyway, she'd hate to let anything bad happen to Marina. On their way into town, they pass a restaurant and decide to ransack it for food. But that's not the only thing they find. Oh god, what's in here? A boy about Marina's age huddles in a dark corner, shivering. After a moment, she recognizes him from the train. Oh, it's this guy again! He's the Eastern Union soldier. He's in a bad way, and it's not hard to guess why. His bare arm is covered in track marks. Oh. Not only is he shell-shocked, he's an addict. Great. This is Levi, and he doesn't have much to say. He seems embarrassed at the state he's in, but he just can't face the world in this condition. Not when it's like this. In the real world, more Give him a heroin! I love how that's an option. Just give him heroin. Again, more more games need the option to give your party members hard drugs. War. And as doctors and medics at the time didn't understand the precautions that needed to be taken, a lot of men went home with a monkey on their back. Yeah, L.A. Noir, result, I remember the that. For a cheaper and dirtier fix rapidly arose to meet their needs. The same would appear to be true in Fear and Hunger. There's no shortage of junk in Preheview, stashed away in boxes and suitcases. Yeah. Green and nabbed some in case of an emergency, and, well, now's as good a time as any. The young man looks astonished at the gift, and the pair turn away awkwardly while he shoots up. Mm. In short order, he's, well, not better, but at least he feels that way. His name is Levi. He's originally from Preheville, but he's been at the front for the last five years. He's come home now that the war's over, but only because he had nowhere else to go. Oh, great. Unfortunate. Even before things fell apart here, there was nobody waiting for him to come back from the front. Levi's addiction manifests as a massive stat penalty, which is always present unless he gets a fix. Satisfying his craving, however, gives him some huge buffs, particularly to his speed, and easily makes him better than any other character in terms of baseline stats. Oh, okay. This reliance on consumables means that as a companion, he's often dead weight, as you tend to want to save the stuff for boss fights. But you can easily fix him with Marina's engraved skill. Slapping the god of fear and hunger sigil on our boy will boost his agility up to be just about on par with everybody else, and faster than most monsters. Oh yeah, I forgot that she could do that. Yeah, a, a part of her thing was she could she could literally do blood magic on people to make them better. So yeah, give the guy is like 
carve stuff into his skin so that he's just he's not as bad when he's like going through one of his slumps great oh god you gotta love these mechanics though don't you they're not horribly depressing at all or you can give him a small things amulet and slap a grogroth sigil on him which will do the same thing but also bump his attack up i mean that's good at least things are a bit different Depending on your choices, Levi can actually start without an addiction, and his pistol ability makes his Luger hit like a 303 rifle in the field. Oh, it's okay. Stuff. Yeah, that does sound good. Marina I, you have the chance of not being addicted. Oh, that sucks. It feels bad for the poor guy. And Prehavelians have to look out for each other. The young yeah. man has the solitary soul, but that's no reason he should have to go it alone. She invites him to tag along, and the three head for the church. They pass the circle, as in the other scenarios, but this time, things play out differently. Samari is here, and so is Father Domek. He's alive. She has trouble composing herself, but and she finally gets his attention flesh when pillar. she says she's here because of Marina. Domek snaps back in anger, misgendering Marina and refusing to even speak her name. Uh. He mutters that she took a cowardly path, rather than living as a male and entering the priesthood like she was meant to. But, he says, Marina is far away and won't be found here. So you think! Samari starts with a rehearsed speech. It really sounds like she did come here to kill Domek and is psyching herself up. But when Domek hears that Marina is in Prehevil, he loses his composure. He tries to get her to explain herself, but she just keeps going with her spiel. So he grabs her, and things go downhill from there. Smack! Okay! Oh, yeah, and he's dead. Great. Don't make fall to the Babylon. ground and Samari runs off. Marina rushes to her father's aid. She's always hated the man, but he's still family, and she never wanted this. Tomek is an interesting guy. On the surface, he's just your average closed-minded parent. But there's something else going on here. He only misgenders Marina when he's speaking to a stranger about church business, and he has to keep correcting himself to do it. We know from Marina's backstory that the church meant for her to be a man of the cloth, and that she's part of a long tradition of very powerful dark priests. Here we find out that Domek always knew, and despite his disapproval, he never stopped her. He never even brought it up before now. As he lays dying, he speaks her name, and the last thing he says is, You know better, stupid girl. Oh... <laughs> you gotta love that. It, it, he, he's putting up the fakeade of being, like, an ignorant and bigoted person. It, like, correcting himself so that he purposefully misgenders her? Oh... Again... This, you know, it's it's the sort of thing that happens in, in indie games like this, but like the writing The writing in this I just and it might also be the fact that this is like there's no voice acting So everything's happening in your head and you can see it written out But I almost I almost wonder if you'd ever like if you'd ever be able to get a character sort of that nuanced happen in a bigger game Just with the with all the combinations of like higher-ups the voice voice acting just all that sort of stuff Whatever else you can say about the man, he cared about his daughter. The letter he sent Marina was meant to keep her away from Prehebu. Redeemed? No. Not after all that stuff we saw in the basement. The letter was supposed to keep her- Well, you kind of failed at that, because all you said was, Your mother is dead. So, I mean, you'd assume that if, you're, if her mother was dead, she would come back to attend the funeral at the very least. Like, you didn't- You could have literally just sent her nothing and had her not come back. Yeah, actually doing nothing in this in, in this instance would have been better. This moment shows the strength of Haberainen's writing. In the midst of all this over-the-top horror and chaos, there's a little story about a terrible person who displays a tremendous amount of depth. The man knew what was coming, and one of his last acts was to try to save his daughter from the festival that has torn Prehavil to pieces. Mm. And then he melts into the floor. Oh, okay, what? The pair follow Samari into the locked basement by smashing through the floor as before, but this time they find her cowering and sobbing in a corner, rather than boasting about what she's done. When confronted, she's hysterical, one moment saying she did it all for Marina, another saying she didn't mean to kill anybody. 
She right. says that it's all because of him, the fiend at the top. Referring, of course, to our friend Perkala. Whose incitement to kill appears to have had quite the effect on this unstable young woman. Oh no. As upset as Marina is, cooler heads prevail. She assures the strange woman that she doesn't hate her and urges her to come back to the train where it's safe. Samari refuses at first, but eventually Marina talks her into it. Back at the train, things become a little clearer, though Samari's verbal tics don't help. Samari and Marina both attended school at the Vatican, but while Marina was an occultist, Samari was a member of the Ninth Circle, a secret organization that binds children to the old gods with barbaric rituals that inevitably kill them. What? Samari is, essentially, a living human sacrifice. A dead woman walking made in a vain attempt to bring the dead and distant old gods back to the world. Oh, okay. Samari's left her unstable, and there's a further issue. She's a mind reader. While Marina was busy being the popular girl at the Ministry of Darkness, Samari watched her from the shadows. Poor social skills, a fractured ego, and a total lack of boundaries are a recipe for disaster even under normal circumstances. Oh. Throw mind reading into the mix, and you're in for an uncomfortable time. So, she was literally reading Maria's mind, and th and I'm guessing through the uh, through years of just suppression and misremembering, she thought that they were they had been friends, and that. Yeah, she had told her. Oh, okay. Samari seems to have internalized many of Marina's thoughts, even intrusive ones she'd never act on, like the motion that Marina hated her father enough to want him dead. Oh, Samari became obsessed with Marina okay. and fell in love with her, but what she failed to realize was that they'd never actually met. Oh God, that's sad. It's a tragedy for everyone involved. They'd Samari never is aware actually now that met. she's done wrong, but she can't seem to piece together how it got to this point. Worse, she doesn't have long to live. Whatever they did to her at the Vatican has drastically shortened her lifespan. Samari didn't make the wooden world. She didn't trap Domek in a pillar. That stuff was already there. All she did was stab Domek, and it doesn't look like she's going to stab anyone else. Okay. Listening to Perkala ruined the only shot at happiness in her short life. Now, she simply asks Marina to understand that she loves her, and slumps in her seat at the back of the train. I get... So... <sighs> I mean, I, I, I very much hope that uh, Worm Girl goes into this, but what is this wooden world? I mean, she didn't make it. It's just sort of there. Her father seemingly, like, melted into it after he died and becomes a part of that pillar? I just... Oh, okay. I, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've said this, but this game is weird, right? Samari's sad story ends here. She has no further motivation to participate in Termina once she realizes how deluded she's been. Oh. Now, she's just a lonely caterpillar, she says, waiting for her metamorphosis. Thirteen more contestants to go. Abella, Marina, and Levi head up to the mayor's manor and find Henrik, who's in the process of losing his Oh, mind. wait. No, I'm currently only, uh, it's currently only possible to save Henrik, Abella, Sabrine, if you're playing as, uh, Abella. However, I showed that uh, the Sam scene as Marina, as uh, she gets extra dialogue, Marina is absent here only due to fiddly routing stuff. Okay. They snap him out of it and he returns to the train with his cooking supplies. Okay, so he's not going to turn into a monster. That's great. From now on, Henrik will provide free food to the party, topping off their hunger anytime they come visit him during the evening. Oh, wonderful. If they tell him about the restaurant, he'll move there instead and offer meals around the clock. Oh, Don so they have a place the in the town. Scorched villager. His injuries make no sense. It looks like a combination of radiation sickness and frostbite, but in places, the man's flesh is charred black. Even stranger, where the rotting skin is peeled away, the muscle beneath it is hard like boiled leather. Even burnt crispy in places. Was this like some version of a nuclear bomb or something? I guess, is that just what like the green light of these gods is like? The man shouldn't be alive, or at the very least, he should be bleeding all over the place. Karen finds him, and though the two have done nothing but argue since they arrived, it's clear that they're both Moon trying to scorched. help. They discuss the matter as they try to interview the villagers who are still up and about. The residents of Old Town, when they can speak coherently, rant and rave about a green light in the sky that burned like ice. The fact that they all say roughly the same thing is especially worrying. Don is familiar enough with hallucinogens to understand that different people all dosed at the same time would likely see very different things. 
Yeah, so this isn't a hallucination that they saw. Led by the Kingdom of Rondon, has developed a new weapon that uses atomic energy to create a massive explosion. This Nuclear bomb, bomb, dubbed Project Bow and Arrow, was set to change the course of the war before it ended. And the blast and subsequent radioactive fallout from such a device could explain the light that people saw and some of the symptoms. Oh, great. Karen smirks, forcing... If a nuclear bomb wasn't bad enough, you have a nuclear bomb that may or may not include aspects of old gods and their magics. Yay. <laughs> Don to admit that, yes, he has considered that the military might be behind this whole thing. Of course they would be. But radiation doesn't cause massive mutations on this scale, and there are no reports of such a noticeable weapon being used on the continent. It's a theory he's considered, but it doesn't seem likely. Don is not a real doctor. He served as a medic in the Eastern Army, and prior to that he received private tutoring from his father-in-law, the Baron Einer von Dutch. But his interest in medicine goes back to his childhood. Okay. Don's parents were cultists of Sylvian. Though the practice has largely died out, there are still pockets of believers who don bunny masks and go out to lose themselves in secret bacchanalia. At Great, first, it wonderful. Was just an occasional thing, but over time they grew more and more obsessed with their goddess of love, growing more distant from their everyday lives. One day, yeah. goddess of love in that in the most literal sense of the word, just never came back. Don found himself on the street, just another orphan in Rondon. He tried this and that to keep himself fed, but eventually found minor success performing traditional medicine. One day, the Baron Einer von Dutch happened by his shop. He was a dilettante, interested in the occult as nobles sometimes are, Yeah, he of struck course up a they friendship are. with Don, taking him under his wing and having him taught about modern medicine in exchange for sharing his secrets about Sylvia. Okay, that's the, that's the thing, it's like, when you... I, 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 I mean, it might be just the side effect. I mean, I mean, of course, you see how weird a lot of rich people are in real life. I mean, it just kind of it keeps with the territory where you have these people who are so rich, they're so bored, they look into stuff that's really weird and creepy. Ugh. The Baron also taught Don about an otherworldly being known as Vitruvia. Yeah. As previously mentioned, Vitruvia is referred to in legends as the architect of the human body. Oh yeah, her. It is she who created Almer at Sylvian's behest. Stories. So wait, oh, oh, okay. Well, it was created at the behest of Sylvia, huh? Okay, so that's where he came from. Because originally, um, it was I was always a little bit confused where he just sort of appeared out of nowhere. Like, of course, of course, with like real world Christianity, Jesus was. You know, born of Mary, virgin birth, is the son of God. But I... I granted, I wonder if you could look at God in some context as like an old one of some kind. Like an all-powerful, all-knowing being. And then you have Jesus, his son, and then in this in this universe you have Almer being like created at, at the behest of one of the old gods. Huh. Okay, I can see that. Hmm. These are fuzzy, but it's unclear what kind of being Vitruvia is. She has no sigil, and no affinity is needed to use her powers, but if she's a new god, she's never clearly depicted as such. Vitruvia's powers, known as medical, operate on the principle of equivalent exchange. Don can harvest organs from defeated enemies and offer these up to remove status effects from his allies. Oh, okay. In an emergency, he can also use the Magna Medical ability, which allows him to offer parts of his own body in order to keep a recently deceased person alive. I do love that. It's like, this guy has a sniffle! Here's a human heart! Despite his lowly origins, Don was eventually married to Von Dutch's daughter, Elise. Shortly thereafter, the Second Great War began, and Don was called oh, to course. the front to serve as a medic. When he finally got home, he found the Baron's house quiet and unlit. Eventually, he made his way to the basement, where he discovered the Baron standing in the middle of an unknown sigil on the floor, covered in self-inflicted wounds. The man Great. was dead, propped up only by some unseen force, and strewn about the room were remnants of his final sacrifice, Elise. Oh. Don did everything he could to save his wife, sewing her back together and sacrificing every part of himself that he could spare to mend her mangled body. Oh, he acted God. beyond all reason to preserve her life, but his efforts were futile. Elise was dead. Her own father had fallen into madness and killed her in service to some dark and nameless power. Great. Don searched the Baron's writings, finding the same sigil he'd seen on the floor and references to a city in Bohemia called Preheville. Something big was due to happen there soon, and Von Dutch wanted to be there for it. Of so, course. So, Don traveled east, eventually arriving here in search of the truth behind his wife's death and his father-in-law's spiral into madness. It's clear he's onto something, at least. 
Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be anything the pair can do for these people. Marco stares at the ceiling. He's been racking his brain trying to think of a way to help. He tried walking back along the tracks to find a way out of town, but somehow he just looped around back in the fog, oh. even though he'd been following the rails. So we're doing Silent Hill now. Now he's back in Old Town, catching a nap in the mayor's manor. Don't get out of there. You have no idea how it's going to twist you. You might have like deer antlers when you mutate or something, or you might have a second head. Who knows? He's been looking for a wheelchair for Olivia. She's been putting on a brave face, but he can tell it's really upsetting for her to be stuck in one place during an emergency. Mm -hmm. He's half asleep when he feels a presence nearby and sits up. Oh no. Kaligura! Hi! The captain whacks the bed frame threateningly with his pipe, demanding to know why Marcos followed him to Prahibu. Marcos pretty sure he could break this guy in half, but he humors him. Caligura, as it turns out, is paranoid that his rival Ocardo is coming after him. Oh. Given that Marco just killed the man, that's not likely. But yeah. it doesn't seem like a productive thing to say, even if Caligura was in a mood to believe him. Marco explains that he's running away from the family and simply took the first train out of town. Caligura is suspicious, but he accepts the answer and backs off. What is never explained is what Caligura is doing here. He's a mob captain from Vatican City. Prahebu is all the way on the other side of Europa, and until a week ago, there was a war going on. Yeah! If you're playing you... Isabella and you sleep here on the first day, Caligura will attack for a different reason. Oh, of He's course. He's a terrible person, perhaps due to his decrepit soul. Also again, I say it again. How much would it suck to be born into this world and be born with a decrepit soul? That just, like, that almost seems like the sort of thing where, like, you specifically, like, time when you try to have a baby just so they don't get born during a month where that's a thing. Like, ignoring the fact that it actually does seem to have, like, an effect on people in real life, in this world's life. Um, like, that just seems like, that just seems like, like, uh, like fodder for all sorts of ridicule in school at the very least. Like, haha, he's a creep because he has his decrepit soul. Jeez. That's just sad. And depressing. Known as Count Dragul, Caligura has risen through the ranks of the family to become a captain. But the cutthroat nature of organized crime has really worn him down. Yeah, one now, would think, yeah. he's so angry and paranoid that he can hardly deal with anybody. We don't see much of Caligura otherwise. He can attack Levi or get into a confrontation with Henrik, and both instances appear to be cases of him being a nasty little jerk. Ugh. Killing him gives access to a few criminal skills, notably the ability to craft pipe bombs, which are really good in combat. Okay, yeah, what well, yeah, you think? Until night on day two, Caligula will transform into the monster, a hideous creature that lives in the sewer. It appears. <laughs> I mean, which ones, dude? You have, you seem to have a lot more than normal. Here's to be a reduction of Caligula to his basest form. Ugh. A vile degradation of a man that can only think of violence. Ugh. That sucks. Caligar is a bit of a mystery. He's clearly meant to serve as a minor antagonist, and he plays the role well. But why he's here and what exactly he's up to are unclear. Henrik accuses him of trying to turn people against each other, and Levi can be seen reading the book that he's named after. But we get little more than that. It seems clear that he aims to win Ura. Termina, and he's one of the only participants who actually attempts to do so. Oh, okay. I suspect future content will expand his role. For now, he's just a really crummy guy. <laughs> For now, he just sucks. The side of the city in ruins is especially disheartening. A meat for pie, Marina eh? And Levi. Marina had a lot of happy memories of this place. Levi doesn't, but it was the only home he ever knew. They evade some strange, sewn together monstrosities that float around like weird little parachutes and find themselves in a department store, which seems normal except for all the screaming. Near uh, the top of the place, the architecture gets decidedly Asherian. Oh, the God. Apex, the source of the screaming is discovered. A group of men and one woman, bound and strung up on hooks and chains. It's a baffling sight for the trio, and worst of all, Levi is left wondering if they didn't actually get up there willingly. The more I see of the character design in this game, the more I can't help but think of like the Cinnabites. It's like these, you know, creatures going, like trying to experience the most extreme pain because they feel it as pleasure or something. Like, I, if we see, like, an enemy at some point who just has, like, rows upon rows of nails jammed into his head or something at some point, I'm, like, I'm calling it now, okay? For those familiar with the first game, these resemble the Chains of Torment. But the Tormented One is dead in pretty much every interpretation of the game's events. Okay. So what gives? 
While plundering bookshelves, the player may randomly come across a book titled New Poems of Love and Torment by Ron Shambara. Supposedly written in the 16th century, it mentions a dead crow. The player can actually find such an item, and offering it up at a circle dedicated to the new gods will summon the man, the myth, the legend, the new god himself. Ron Shambara the Tormented One. Wait, really? It's a brutal fight designed for the end game, and winning it grants access to the Chains of Torment spell. Okay. <laughs> New gods who have completed their tenure don't really die. As we've seen, they are instead relegated to the Hall of the Gods, where they sit and converse and occasionally dispense wisdom. But we've seen at least one new god wriggle out of this fate, as Masra used to be one, and somehow he's still alive in the world, even though the Fellowship killed him and probably took his soul. So in this case, it's just a new god, another new god trying to escape the, the new god retirement home. Wonderful. He won't be found in the Hall of the New Gods in either game. Oh. So the Tormented One must have avoided his fate. What exactly he's doing now is unclear, but New Gods seem to come in groups of four. The Tainted One is the primary New God that players will interact with. She can be summoned by offering severed heads, which she will trade for Soul Stones, the game's version of experience points. Oh, okay. She speaks of agony that burns from within, but she doesn't have much to say. The player may also find a photograph of a 19th century man with the face scratched off. Offering it to the circle summons the Radiating One, who implores the player to cherish their own imperfections and to love the distortion. He doesn't say much else, but he'll trade those rust-colored pearls found in the wooden world for powerful items. Well, I mean, that is, you know, some level of good, um, uh, um, advice. You know, I mean, like, no matter how much you work, you're always going to have some sort of flaw or imperfection, so don't stress about it. Um, granted, that could be taken to some extremes where you just never try to improve yourself ever. Um, so, you know, take everything with a little bit of moderation at the very least. Lastly, the player may encounter the Heartless One by taking an especially circuitous route through the sewers to get to the church basement without cutting down the chandelier. Okay. There's a key in one of the cells which unchains a being found in the wooden world if the player draws a second rare sigil in the church. This is the Heartless One, a cruel female figure who wears a shroud of pure darkness and wields the strongest sword in the game. She appears to have inspired a film in the game's world, Heartless Angel, and what little we hear from her suggests that the name is entirely apt. Karen's backstory suggests that the new gods are sort of an Illuminati, yeah. shadowy puppeteers behind the scenes who most people don't even know about. There are wild theories that Kaiser has been working with these four, that they've orchestrated great wars, that they've been steering the course of human development, and that it's all culminating here and now in whatever has happened to Preheview. Oh god, I mean, just, I mean, look at these, look at these four weirdos. I mean, at least with the very, at least with, like, the previous set, they looked somewhat normal, apart, apart from the one guy who was, looks like he's been turned inside out. But, like, here you have one that's, like, perpetually strapped into a chair with, I don't even want to try to figure out where the person begins and where the chair ends. You have another one, well, again, Heartless Angel, all black body with like covered in carapace and just like pin needle feet that's almost like v and j for murder drones you have that little goblin thing at the very top and then once again um inside out man like, what is with these new gods and looking so absolutely freakish granted it did say that the the new gods were somehow like their abilities and personalities were based on their soul so i guess this is just a, a really bad batch to karen this all sounded like hogwash, but it's clear that these four are present here. Yeah. Right Have you Bob is a jazz club located in the northwest side of town. Murray and a butterfly. the place, and even Levi seems to relax a little as the three stop in to take a break. He takes up a spot near the piano, prompting the occultist to ask him if he plays. He admits that he doesn't. Da -da 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 -da. Time, his mother wanted to teach him, but that was before his dad killed her and he wound up living at the orphanage. Oh, wonderful. He was sent to the front as a child soldier when he was just 13 years old, and that's really all he's ever known. He's only 18, it turns out. Marina's age. Wow, okay. They really are from opposite sides of the tracks. Abella sees something out of the corner of her eye. A blue moth, but it's gone a moment later. Oh, great. It leads her to what she discovers is a trapdoor into a speakeasy below. It's a nameless Liberty Underground hideout. Oh, it's these guys again. Haven't heard of them in, in a while. In a stockpile of guns and ammunition, Abella spots a map with several marked locations on it. The missing team must have gone down to check these out. What a lucky break. Outside, yeah, wonderful. Outside, find somebody relatively sane. She's an old fortune teller, and for a shilling, she'll read the cards. 
How is this going to turn bad? It appears you are in search, or in desperate need of a select few relics of importance. The self-fellating man. The one symbolizing the downfall of man. The primal weakness. That one you can find in the moldy prison that houses the foul and the weary. Okay. The gaping hunger. The one symbolizing endless hunger and endless discontent. That one you can find where one starts their long journey on the path to that very same discontent. Oh no. The martyr. Doesn't sound good. the martyr, okay. The one symbolizing the need for idols. The need for dreams to look up to. The need for those to blame at the darkest hour. Naturally, you can find that one in the House of the Holy. Wait, are these those little Holy statues Red. that were missing? It appears there is another path. Hidden in plain sight. The three rivers lead you to the promised land. A man-made conflict hides a stream of consciousness. A stone fortress that rises in the deep green. Oh, Follow up stream. A treasure hidden behind a waterfall. Okay. Hope you got your shillings worth. I, I hope so too! She must be talking about the effigies. And it sounds like the hunger effigy is nearby at the orphanage. Levi gets a sinking feeling. He's been unconsciously heading that way all day. It's the only place he knows and the last place he wants to see. Uh, that's For Marina, that's too, it's very depressing. Plot. Her father founded St. Domecq's Orphanage. It bears his name and his portrait hangs in the entryway. The orphanage at first seems fairly normal, at least for the time and place. Great, everything's made of wood! The First Great War left a lot of orphans and the second didn't help. So the church stepped up to provide for the unfortunates who had no one else to support them. The place is a little spartan, and the school and prayer schedules seem strict, but at least the kids had someone to look after them, right? You better hope! His stomach turns as he enters. He can smell the flowery perfume that the nuns used to wear, and it makes his skin crawl. Oh. This is the institution that handed him this state to be used as a child soldier, and while it was once his home, it was never a very nice place. Some of the children still roam the halls. Oh god. Now transform into little cherubs with razor sharp claws. Oh no. It's best to use the handgun here as it drops them in a single shot. If engaged what? in melee, they attack in groups of three and will very quickly deal a lot of damage. What? The rotting floor breaks, dumping the group down into the basement. Here it becomes Whoops. evident that the unsettling feeling on the surface was concealing the true darkness beneath. Shackles, blood, and evidence of something horrific are scattered everywhere. Oh god. More wood. The three eventually find the headmaster's office, where Father Donovan Hugo awaits them with the- Oh, it's one of these freaks again! Great! Marina knows this man, or at least she knows about him. She says he's a creep, and there are rumors that he's some sort of ancient vampire who bathes in the blood of infants. Oh wait, what was, what was that they were talking about? How, like, humanity had, um, had, 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 like, killed all of the- um, the, like, the easily seen out monsters from the outside, so now they were looking for the ones on the inside. They found one! They need to get a rid of them! Far-fetched once, but after seeing the basement... Yeah! He wordlessly reaches out to embrace Levi, but the ex-soldiers found a new god now. And so the battle The, the god of heroin! Yeah, the, that, that's just it. The god of heroin has nothing on the, on the old gods. It's absolutely nothing! Father Hugo can be a very difficult boss. He casts he has green earth, skin, which makes everyone vulnerable to fire. The trick here is to set him ablaze with an ornament lantern, pyromancy trick, or a murky vial, and then try to take out his arms so that he can't cast spells. Oh, okay. Well, th you make it sound so easy. Too, so he winds up taking tons of damage. Oh, okay. Well, he talk dies about without ever having said a word. His body looks unusually fit and sturdy, but he doesn't appear to be mutating like everybody else. Just what were the priests in this town doing? Is that a noose? Levi pilfers a key off of his carcass, and the three leave by cutting across the courtyard, which inexplicably has a gallows in it. Oh. The story goes that this place used to be a jail, but Marina notes that in the old photos, the gallows was out front, not back here. That shed looks a little odd. Oh, look! The wood world again! The three stand in the trenches of Great Battlefield, all mud and razor wire with what look like petrified soldiers heaped dead on the ground. Oh, look, Levi there's another one. Saying that he can't be here, that he left the front. 
But Marina's able to calm him down, reassuring him that it's not real. It's got to be some kind of magic. There are more Ron Yeah, just sort of some sort of magic. A statue of a fallen angel clutching an effigy. This one is hunger, carved in the likeness of the lower half of the god of fear and hunger and representing need and discontent. The lower half, yeah. Its position matches the gallows in the real schoolyard, and there's an obvious connection. The battlefield sends kids to the orphanage, and the orphanage sends kids to the battlefield. The modern world co-ops the natural cycle of life and death, grinding millions to dust in the gears of industry. Uh... They return to the real world via the magic circle. Oh god, you you know the, the that these old gods would just like eat up the military industrial complex. I mean, what what is that doing for them? They have two effigies now. What will happen when they find the third? Karen finds a group of moon scorched living like moles beneath the city. It's not clear whether they came down here to hide from the monsters in the moonlight or if their condition compelled them. Most are hostile, but she does get an interview out of one guy. He tells her the tournament has been going on for a while now. First it hit the town, involving everyone in Preheville pretty much, but it didn't stop there. When Kaiser's men arrived, another festival started, and they all got sucked into it. Karen and her group are the third consecutive festival. He's not extremely sane, but the way he talks about this suggests that it's a local custom that happens every so often. Oh, okay! So just this weird moon festival thing just normally happens, and the only reason why it's gotten so bad this time is the fact that it's happened three times in a row! Okay, that's... oh, no. But this time it's pretty much depopulated and destroyed the city. Much of the damage topside, it turns out, was done well before the marching men of Night's Day got here. Karen can't get her head around any of these ancient gods or the idea that this is really all the moon's doing. But the notion that a barbaric, long-standing local custom has been corrupted so badly that it's completely destroyed a modern city is something to chew on. Yeah. There are flyers around the city telling people to report if they dream of Perkala. These must have been put out a couple of weeks ago, probably by the church. The mutated police officers keep saying that the high priest put out a curfew order. Was the church trying to contain the damage? Were they working with Kaiser or against them? Why not both? Abella leads the group south into the Maiden Woods. Are those landmines? They used to sacrifice temple maidens out here in the old days. Given all the three have seen, perhaps they still do. Oh! Strange men in owl costumes attack them with poisoned darts, summoning forth bizarre phantom birds. But the three are able to fight their way past, heading deeper and deeper into the forest until they come upon a lone bunker guarded by a hideous abomination. Before I look, take a look at that thing, I just love the fact, the way this is edited, just whack, just a single whack and then you see the guy lying on the floor. <laughs> the centaur appears to be a human fused with a horse, but the body is twisted, distorted, and covered in bandages. Yeah, uh, that's not how you do a centaur, man. That, uh, that's just not. The creature does its best to trample the three, but they're able to escape into the bunker. Here's a hint. Don't fight the centaur. It sucks. <laughs> it just, it, here's a hint. Just don't get near this thing. It, it, it's horrible. Massive AOE damage if the legs are intact, and it still hits hard even if you break some of them. It counters attacks to its heads with poisonous vomit, and it's just generally deadly. It doesn't even drop anything. The bunker leads down into a set of tunnels similar to where Abella and Marina met, though moss encroaches here as the forest tries to reclaim the concrete. Yeah. Deeper down, they spot another phantom, the woman with the red shoes, who hisses and flickers with static before vanishing. Oh, the blue butterflies again. Worryingly, there are a few severed limbs here, and a half-completed sew job. Somebody's making these. Oh, no. As they progress through the tunnel complex, yeah. they find out Get who, saw. still living blobs of meat, likely the remnants of the Bremenites who capture this place, are sewn together in bizarre, impossible combinations, one group forming what could only be called a human centipede. Oh no! A girlish giggle spills from the sewn shut lips of their creator and tormentor, a stitched together woman brandishing a needle and thread. Blue paint covers her chin and throat, and it's hard to tell exactly where her clothing ends and her body begins. Okay, so obviously this blue paint the, the blue paint, it seems to be a constant for, like, these weird, messed up people. These... Who are they? Because they're they're obviously doing something here. Oh. Finding stitches is not a particularly good idea, as she hits hard and she's easy to avoid. If you lose to her, you'll wind up as part of the human centipede. So, oh, why? Great. You know, that's fun. Yeah, very. If the player is playing as Don, they'll discover another disturbing lair. This is his late wife, Elise. Or at least, it's her body and face. She never speaks and makes no sign of recognizing him. But he'd know his dead wife's face anywhere. Oh no! The group is able to lose her in the tunnels, and take the elevator deeper into the complex. There, they encounter another figure. 
It's Osa. He's been shot with a cursed green arrow, which is sealing some of his magic power, but he's alive. Yeah, long time he's no see. He's very and standoffish, but a persistently helpful Abella manages to talk him into joining their party. Yeah, let me try. The only way of getting that arrow out is you need to push it all the way through. At least that's, I think that's how you do arrows. Uh, granted, this is green and magic, so there might be something weird going on with this one. Osa came down here looking for secrets, possibly because he has the enlightened soul. He's cagey about his motivations and who shot him, but playing as Osa reveals that he's in Preheville at Nasra's direction. Yeah, the, the shrunken head. He predicted that Termina would happen and instructed his people to take part and claim whatever prize he could at its culmination. But both Osa and Nasra know that something more is going on here. Termina is a known phenomenon that just sort of happens sometimes. But it seems just, that some great happens. No one can explain it. One, and that the most powerful people in the world have a vested interest in it. Behind Osa, there's a big machine. The yellow mage asks if Abella knows what it does, and she simply pushes a button which turns it on. That's okay, it. that's Something? two. Osa asks if she knows what she's doing. She just gives him a shrug. <laughs> Could be turning on some sort of weird particle accelerator that will birth a new god. Who knows? I mean, in real life, they they feared that the part that the super hydron collider would like create a black hole that would eat the inside of the earth. Who knows that it, this is just they're not going to create a new old one out of something or other. And that is the end of the second part of this super massive reaction. As always, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Links to all the other parts are both in the description and in the corner cards. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked it. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not, and see you in the next part!